Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's the best y'all sounded in a while. Did I get y'all stirred up during choir practice? Is that what happened? Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, let's stay in worship for this evening. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever. 
If you have your Bible, let's go ahead and turn to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Uh, we'll look at a passage I trust that we're all pretty familiar with. This morning we looked at the subject of hell. Uh, and so I found it fitting that we would uh, flip the coin and look at the doctrine of heaven. As you can imagine, a lot of people have a lot of questions about heaven. So let me encourage you this, this evening. I will not answer every question you've ever had about heaven, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you'll miss Cracker Barrel for lunch next Sunday if we were to do that, all right? And I'd have to make up half, half the answers I could give you. Uh, but what I want to do is give you um, uh, what the Bible says and give you sort of the big picture of, of what heaven will be like, as I uh, trust we're all looking forward to. So with that, if you'll stand with me out of reverence for God's Word, we'll read the first seven verses. The Apostle John writes on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, beginning in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven, the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. They will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Our Father, I ask, as always, you'd open our, our hearts and our minds, our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our hands, our feet. Um, that our entire being is transformed. Uh, by the truth of God's word and the power of his saving gospel. Uh, Lord, would you be so kind as to uh, um, help us have some understanding of what awaits those who are in Christ, how we long for the day uh, that we see you face to face um, and we get to worship at your throne. In the name of your glory, Son, we pray. Amen. Be seated. Several years ago, there was a... Uh, lady in the church that we served at previously who we were quite fond of and uh, she would watch our, our son uh, she, she, she didn't really get to, to meet our, our, our daughter uh, and, 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 but she, she would babysit our son and uh, we were just really close to her to be honest with you the first time I ever preached at, at, at the church it was in view of a call is the early stages of that I thought the woman I'm talking about for months hated my guts and I mean just hated me because she had this scowl on her face when she heard a sermon. I mean, it was just a mean-looking scowl. And I didn't talk to her for, like, forever. Like, I would give the standard, hello, how are you? But I, I didn't want to get, get close to her. And everyone was saying how she's the nicest person in the world. I and mean, she may be nice to you. <laughs> she despises me. Right? And it was just, she, she just gave this very serious scowl with her Bible open. Like, she took that just very seriously. Uh, just coming by that, everyone was right. She was the sweetest lady. Uh, you know, just fantastic, fantastic lady. And uh, she was uh, pushing her, her 90s, and, and I remember uh, visiting her one day, and she shared with me uh, that she was about to have surgery. And she was really nervous because she's never had to stay at a hospital before. She's never had surgery before, never had a knee replacement, and she was barely on, like, uh, uh, blood pressure medicine. I mean, she, she, she just, what you think of someone at, at that age, she, she just wasn't her story. She'd been single her whole life, and she'd spent uh, her working years uh, working insurance. And because she was single, uh, the company had her travel all over the place, right? And near the end of her life, uh, she got on a bus with a bunch of other seniors and went to New York, the only state she had never visited. Just got on a bus and just went and said, I'll be back when I'm, I'm back. She was a fascinating lady, hardworking, still mowed her yard, had a little dog that annoyed me to, to – you know, but but you know, just just will we'll walk her dog every day, and it was just a very active and, and wonderful lady. We just loved her to death. But she was really nervous about this surgery, and 
Um, I, I noticed that leading up to surgery, she was reading a book, and the book was uh, Brandy Alcorn's Heaven. And we talked about this this little book, or not, not quite little, over 400 pages, but uh, we we talked about why is it she's reading that book, and it had just been published. It's probably the most popular known book that looks at the issue of heaven. And she, she was uh, just honest. She goes, look, I know I, I may not have many years left, and I, I just want to every day think about what awaits me as, as a woman in faith. And that just really struck me. Well, uh, she had her surgery, and, and during uh, all that, we actually had our daughter, and um, she had some complications weeks later. Uh, she went, and it was just a minor surgery, nothing serious. And um, but it, it seemed to open the door to a series of cancers that just ate her up. And within, uh, so, so as she, she just found that out, I, I showed her pictures of our daughter. We had just gotten back from the hospital, and uh, within a week, she she had passed away. She she was gone. It just it was one of those situations that just just was too fast, and just it was really hard on. On me as, as, a, as a new pastor and, and everything else. And well, at her funeral, uh, we, we talked about heaven and everything else. And one of her friends uh, came up to me and she gave me a book. And the book was Heaven by Randy Alcorn. This is her book. Uh, this, this is her copy. It's, it's got some of her notes in it. It's got her bookmarks. I don't know why she had so many. Um, but... Uh, this is one of those books that, you know, as, as a general rule, I, if you want to borrow a book, you'll read it, take it, and I don't write it down, and I'll forget that you even took it. Uh, but this is one of those books that's kind of a, a treasure to me, because I'm always reminded of, of what was her longing, her, her deep longing, even in the midst of her fears and, 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 and doubts and whatnot, and a lot of some of her, her medical needs there at the end of her life. It was, at the end of the day, she longed to be with Jesus. She had been in good health her entire life, and yet her greatest longing was just to be with Jesus. And so at her funeral, we, we, we talked a lot about that. So every time I think about heaven, I, I think about um, that woman, and I long for the day that I get to see her again, and she does actually get to meet my daughter. We, she's only, she only saw pictures before, before she, she passed away. Well, no doubt this is a, a, an issue of heaven that we are all curious about, and and just like the issue of how we, we kind of have our own bizarre uh, ideas about heaven that we get, not from the Bible, but often from pop culture. So hopefully we can uh, deal with some of that this evening. And so I, I want to deal with a few issues and answer a few questions. First of all, uh, what, what will heaven be like? That, that's the big question we have today. And, and to begin with, we need to talk about that word heaven. What does the Bible mean by that word heaven? I'm willing to bet that you've probably done what, what I've done in the past, and, and every time you see the word heaven, you think of one thing. At the very least, it's where we go hang out with Jesus when we die, right? At the very least, when we think of heaven. That's not entirely uh, the only way that the Bible uses the word heaven. Let me, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but let me give you just, just three ways that word is used. First of all, it means the sky. The sky. Let me give you an example of this. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than, valuable than they? That word air is uh, the word for heaven. Same word that, that uh, John is using here in, in Revelation 21 is heaven. And, and you get this th th throughout the, the Bible. That when you speak of the air, where airplanes go, right? It will oftentimes speak of it as the heavens. Uh, likewise, similar to that, the cosmos is often described as the heavens. The, you, you've read this verse before, right? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me tell you how I used to translate that or interpret that uh, when I didn't have this understanding was heavens. He created the heavens meant God was like in this dark blackness. And then one day he spoke the earth and then he spoke heaven. We lived on earth. He lived in the heavens, right? That is kind of how I read that. Now, what is, what is Genesis 1 1 describing? It's a summary of what happens in the first chapter. God created the earth, and he created the cosmos. Everything you see, and everything you can't see, right? Because the universe is so massive. God is its creator. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in this, I recommend uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. Uh, he wrote a series of science fiction. Him and Tolkien were supposed to do it together, but Tolkien didn't finish his. Um, in his first book, where Ransom goes to. Uh, uh, I think, I think it was Mars first. Uh, Lewis, in the way that only Lewis can, spends a lot of time uh, describing what it was like to be on the way to Mars. It, he described it as the heavens. He, he argues that in calling it space, we've actually oversimplified the beauty 
of the heavens, that there's a reason why the ancients refer to it as the heavens. Let me give you one of the examples of this. Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Note that God is above the heavens, the universe itself. Right? Then there's the third reason that we're all familiar with. That is the presence of God. This is one that we see throughout the Bible. In fact, to begin with, uh, Paul uses the language of the first, second, and third heaven. The first being the sky, second being the cosmos, third being the presence of God. Uh, Paul tells a story about a man he knew, he's talking about himself, uh, who, uh, whether in body or out of body, whatnot, was caught up in the third heaven. What Paul means by that is the very presence of God. Likewise, Hebrews 8, 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. He's not in the sky. He's not floating on the clouds. He's not hanging out in uh, some other galaxy. No, he is, he is in heaven, the right hand of the throne of the Father. Likewise, Hebrews 9, for Christ has entered not into uh, holy places made with hands, the temple, which are copies of the true things, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He literally says heaven is the presence of God. Or we could see Acts 7.55. Remember Stephen, as he's getting stoned, what does he see? Uh, he gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God. And who does he see there? Jesus. It's Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Well, so when the Bible uses the word heaven, context is very important for us. So, so we don't want to uh, misinterpret what the Bible says, as, as I, uh, especially when I was younger, did a lot of that. But more specifically, what do we want to know about heaven is, is uh, what will our eternal existence be like? What would it be like to hang out with, with Jesus in heaven? Well, a couple things to note here. First of all, let's talk about the place of heaven. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, and which you get in cartoons and comics and, and books and everything else, we are not going to be in heaven as defined by we are chubby cherubs with small wings who no way could have carried our weight uh, with harps ready for us when we float on clouds for eternity, Right? That, that, that is what we often think of heaven. At least it's a very cloudy place. Um, but that, that's not what you get in the Bible itself. Um, Revelation is clear that, our, uh, that heaven is actually much bigger than that. It, it speaks of our future existence with Christ as a new heavens and a new earth. You'll notice here in Revelation 21, what is the word that is repeated over and over again? It is new. Jesus saying, I will, behold, I make all things new. There's a new Jerusalem. There's a new heavens and a new earth. What you have then is that Christ is, is, is creating for us uh, a new heavens and new earth. So what we have is an Eden-like experience, and yet we know God quite differently in the new heavens and the new earth than we did in Eden. And the difference is that God is not only creator, which he'll do again, he's also redeemer. Our understanding of Christ is rooted in that reality, that we are here not only because we were created, but because we were redeemed by our Savior. So uh, Revelation particularly, but not exclusively Revelation, makes a big deal that, that we believe in a new heavens and a new earth. We'll, we'll walk in an in unpolluted, undefiled new heavens and new earth. But, but what about the, the people of heaven? You know, one of the most common questions, I've told you this a million times before, that I received when I was a youth minister is, what will we look like in heaven? And why would teenagers ask that sort of question? Well, you know, uh, because they just had a, a family member <coughs> I mean, pass away, and, and they think, well, uh, whenever I get to be that age, is, is that what I'm going to uh, look like, walk like, live like in, you know, in heaven? And when you're a teenager, you think that you're, you're in the prime of your life, and life is just all downhill from air, and that's largely true. And, and <laughs> most because there's, there's no bills, right? I mean, this to be honest. It has nothing to do with our physical appearance. It has everything to do with bills and taxes. I mean, let's be honest. Oh, and insurance companies. But um, um, what they want to know is when I get to heaven, will I still have muscles in my earlobes, right? I mean, I, I want to be in my very prime of life. Well, that's a vain thing for teenagers to want, but it's exactly what we wanted when we were teenagers, and we just gave up a long time ago. But, but uh, that question is actually not a question in, that's answered in the Bible. For one, it's a very American question. And furthermore, it, it's, it's kind of missing the point. What the Bible cares about is uh, our physical bodies, uh, with our physical bodies, is, is that there is a lack of the effects of the fall on our bodies. I think that's a bigger point. And remember that in, in heaven, time is 
uh, not the way we think of it today. We think very linear uh, and, and chronologically, right? You take that scenario out, and, and suddenly um, aging doesn't exist because there are no ages. So it's kind of a mute point that, that, that we have here. But what the Bible wants, us, wants you to see is that in the new heavens and new earth, death and Hades have been thrown into the lake of fire. All the sin, all the pain, all the decay, all, all, all of that is no more. The effects of the fall affect us no more. That's what the Bible wants us to see. So whether we will look like we're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 70 or, or 969 years that Methuselah was, it's a mute point. The main thing is we will be eternal. Not the age that we would look like. Um, but related to that is, is who will be there in heaven? Now obviously, uh, especially whenever we, we minister to, to people who are suffering the, the loss of a loved one, what they want to know is, well, I see them again. Right? Um, and and we, we've all had this experience. For one, we all have that longing in, in our own souls, don't we? All of us have lost someone's precious. And what is the thing we want more, more than anything in this world? That's just to be united with them again. Well, um, there's hints of this in, in the Bible. Let me give you one example of this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet, them, uh, meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. That, that phrase, with them. Is, is an interesting phrase. And you don't forget the context of 1 Thessalonians writing. Paul is writing from a distance. And his presumption is that he will see the Thessalonians. But however you interpret, interpret the rapture, all that sort of stuff, it isn't my concern with this passage. But rather, the emphasis is, is that the, the church will be together. The church will be together. Now, and I think that's the, 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 inc the in indications throughout it. Um, so what we need to see is, is more than we will see our loved ones, but rather we will see the saints. And we get a hint of this at Mount Transfiguration, don't we? Have you ever noticed Peter seems to automatically know who Moses and Elijah are? How do you handle that? I mean, you can read the stories of Moses and Elijah all you want. For example, George Washington, I've seen plenty of pictures of him, but I've never seen a picture without his wig on, right? I don't know if we're going to have wigs in heaven or not. You can ask someone else who's smarter than me. But, but would you recognize George Washington without that wig? You see him every day on that dollar bill. Right? And yet, here is Peter, who's never seen a picture of Elijah and Moses, immediately recognizes Elijah and Moses in the world of our bodies. How did that happen? The emphasis in the Bible isn't that you're going to see your loved ones. Rather, you're going to see the saints. It's much more glorious, isn't it? Isn't that what you long for? That your loved ones are numbered among the saints. Isn't that a more glorious picture that, that we get in the Bible? Well, here's probably the, the big question that we have. We want to know uh, who, who will be there. Will we recognize them? Will they recognize us? All of that sort of stuff. But I think one of the big questions is, what are we going to be doing up there, right? I mean, eternity is a long time. I mean, you've been a D, to DMV for like 15 minutes, and you're thinking it is an eternity. Now imagine... Uh, and multiplying that by infinity, right? Uh, I mean, what are we going to be doing there the whole time? Well, do I have a treat for you? And I'll give you a few things we'll do. Certainly not an exhaustive list. They all start with the letter L. Let me tell you. Now, let me tell you. Pastors only do that to impress their seminary professors, right? So the professors feel like that they accomplished something. But here's the thing about uh, alliteration like that is uh, half the points I need to explain, right? I mean, you're, you're giving something up to keep the L's, but... That's for your entertainment. First, first thing we're going to do, we're going to law. We're going to worship, okay? That's what I mean by that. It's not many words that start with L. That also means worship. So work with me here. <coughs> Here's the thing is almost every time that the curtain is pulled back and we get to see in the heaven, what is it that we witness? It is worship. True adoration of a risen Savior. You go all the way back to the very beginning of it. And, and the high parts of the Bible, right? Isaiah 6 comes immediately to mind. What is it that they're singing? It's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And what is it that we get in my favorite passage is Revelation 4 and 5. What is the scene there? That, that, that John, after he is taken up, given his vision, what is it he's seeing? He's seeing not just the angels, the 24 elders and all the saints. They, they, they fall down. And worship. They worship in chapter 4 because he is creator. They worship chapter 5 because he is redeemer. There is worship in heaven. And how can you not? 
to be in the very presence of God. And every time someone is in the presence of God, they, 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 don't, they don't just check it off their to-do list for a Sunday morning. And they don't leave immediately that, that, that they pray to dismiss. No, no, they, they are in literal awe. And, and they don't want to ever leave that, that, that very place. There is worship in heaven. And, and we need to be clear that worship will be the priority in heaven. But that leads to, to a question that we all ask, whether publicly or not. But, but, but if worship is our priority in heaven, therefore, does that mean heaven will be boring? No doubt you've heard that question. You've come across the question. And frankly, we've all asked that question. Either to ourselves or, or, or someone else. And I, I just want us to think about what is it we're really communicating there? If all we do in heaven is worship, will heaven therefore be boring? And we assume then worship is boring. And we don't seem to be very bored whenever we are screaming at the top of our lungs of our favorite running back uh, football team, go score a 90-yard touchdown. Because I did that last night watching my favorite team, right? <laughs> Screaming and hollering and everything else, by the way, is a 100-yard kickoff return if you want to know the details. That's worship. To, to, to give your entire being to a cause, to, to a moment, to something you, you care about. It's, it's worship. I've given this example before. I was watching the, one of my soccer teams, and, and they were playing a, an away game. And out of nowhere, all the home crowd lifted up their hands, and they started to sing the team's chants. Now, no one said, please open your hymn books to hymn number 333, Alien on Everlasting Arms. But everyone knew this is the time. We stand up, we raise our hands, and we sing to the glory of our team. Now, what does that sound like to you? How many of us, we don't diet because we worship food? Let's be honest. And none of us are bored at those moments. That game last night was over four hours long. Isn't that awesome? Except for the, 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 the replays the referees kept going to. Why, why, why? Because worship is never boring, first of all. But when we imply that worshiping the Savior will automatically be boring, that says more about our own theology and our heart more than it does anything else. Because many of us will say, because I grew up in a rural county, is, well, I don't need none of them fancy mansions in heaven. Just give me a pond full of fish. That's worship. What you're saying is all you want to do is this one thing. And let me tell you, if, if you want to grow in Christ, the one thing you ought to want to do more than anything is to worship Jesus. That's true freedom. So, so the question itself should, should offend our very uh, sensibilities. And so it does reveal our hearts more than it does heaven. So worship will, will, will obviously be, be right there. And then there is lead. Uh, oh, Revelation 4, 4 9, I already referenced it. Lead. Lead. By this I mean rule. Now, I wish I had all the answers here, but uh, I'll just let the Bible speak for itself. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Man, that's strange. What does he mean by that? And don't you love that Paul didn't explain himself? Moving on to the next verse, right? That's the problem, right? And we're just going to reign with him. Mic drop. Move on. Matthew 24. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Now the context of Matthew 24 is the Olivet Discourse about the end times. And we can debate all day, is he referring just to a, a, a period of time, the millennium, whether it's a literal thousand years or not. Or does this carry on into the new heavens and new earth? I don't know. I didn't learn that in cemetery, and everyone disagreed anyways. But, but notice here the language of rulership, reigning, leadership that we have here from Jesus himself. Revelation chapter 2, uh, uh, Jesus, oh, oh, here's the one, Matthew 25, um, uh, his master said to him, right, this is uh, uh, judgment day, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much, enter into the joy of your master. He's going to set you over what exactly? It's interesting, isn't it, how easy we gloss over some of this. Revelation 2, to one of the churches, Jesus says, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and as uh, earthen pots are broken into pieces, even as I myself have received authority. Of the, I don't know if that's the one I'm looking for. Oh, um, yeah, I will give authority over, over the, the nations. I will give him that, that authority. First Corinthians 6, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? 
Do you not know that you are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to, to, to this life? This is the favorite verse of every business meeting, isn't it, right? <laughs> now, remember what's happening here in, in Corinth is that they are suing each other over disagreements. And Paul says, the day is going to come when you're going to play a role in Judgment Day. If you can't handle this nonsense, what makes you think you're going to handle that up there? Now, the specifics of this, Paul doesn't expound on. But it's striking nonetheless, isn't it? Now, the mystery comes down to is, is what exactly does this look like? Uh, uh, but nevertheless, in, in a new heavens and a new earth, it's a redeemed even, Eden. Uh, then it should come as no surprise that the Lord will expect leadership out of his people. Because what is it you get in Eden? Adam is called to be prophet and priest and king of the earth. He failed at all three, by the way. This is how you get a serpent in the garden to begin with. God gives Adam leadership there in in the garden. Why would the new heavens, the new earth, the new Eden be any different? Then there is labor. By this I mean work and, and serving others. <clears throat> Let's not forget that work is not part of the curse of God. Good reminder on a Sunday evening before we go to work the next day. But rather, work is part of what it means to be human. This is an area I struggle with is, is if I'm not busy doing something, I, I feel... Uh, I don't know what language I'm looking for. I, I feel almost unfulfilled, right? Like, like I need to accomplish something. It's that male drive to, to, to accomplish things, right? To hold it up and say, honey, aren't you proud of me? Some, some sort of thing, right? And we were created to, to work. And then Jesus explains that his father is always working. And he came to do the, the work of the father here on earth. So, so work is, is a very a biblical idea. Now, what happens is that the fall distorts. God's vision for work. For one, it, it, it's, it's made a struggle with laziness, right? We would much rather sit in our favorite chair and watch college football or basketball or rugby, whatever it is you're, you're into. Um, we, it's also destroying that we often want to work for our own benefits. Right? What is it that I can get out of this job or this, this task or, or this whatever it, it might be? Um, and yet what we get are hints of this, that there, there is... There is some form of, of work, some form of, of service, right? Uh, if, if God is working now uh, in heaven, then, then it isn't surprising that we would have that. And again, remember that Adam is given the responsibility of work there in the, in the garden. He is to till and work the ground. He is to exercise his, his role of leadership as a prophet, priest, and, and king. And he is to love and to serve and, and to lead his wife. Um, speaking of love, it's another thing that we will have there. Now, um, one verse that we can come to here is Matthew 22. Um, Jesus says, you are wrong because you need, know neither the scriptures nor the power of God in the resurrection. So now we're speaking of the new heavens and new earth. Uh, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Let me just exegete this real quickly. What Jesus did not say is we will be like angels in heaven. Okay. And that is one of the reasons why we think of our heavenly existence as disembodied spiritual beings, chubby and little wings. That's not what Jesus says. He says, in the context of marriage, we will be like the angels in, in heaven. That is to say, we don't go on dates, and we don't get rejected, and we don't, like all that stuff, right? Is any of you married people glad you'll never have to go on a date again? Uh, I am, Right? I'm glad I found my girl in high school and we moved on with our lives. I'm glad that stuff is way, 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 way behind me. But rather what, what we see here, we get caught up on the marriage part, but what we're missing is, is, is the family part. There is a marriage in heaven. It's between the, 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 the groom, Christ, and his bride, the church. Now the role the church plays isn't as husband and wife, but rather as brother and sister. This is why who we'll meet in heaven isn't just the people we miss the most, but rather it's the saints. That's what we're, what we're longing for. So our relationships will be deeper because there will be eternal relationships by which we will love each other the way the gospel intended us to love one another. Marriage is perhaps the closest we can get to that because it's why God created it, to be a picture of the gospel. But there we don't need a picture of the gospel. The gospel is in the person of Christ and whom we're worshiping for eternity there. So we love each other the way that, that God had intended us to from the very beginning. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is best demonstrated, I, I think, in, in the Bible, in how often food shows up in describing heaven. You ever notice that? I'm sure you have. You're a Baptist. Let me give you a few examples. Luke 22, um, uh, I sign to you as my father's sign to me. A kingdom. That's, that's interesting language Jesus has there for, for his followers. 
that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. I don't know what that's going to look like with the sitting on thrones and judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But it's not interesting. You're going to eat and you're going to drink in my kingdom. Now, the context of that is, 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 is important, right? What are they doing? They're eating and drinking in fellowship, the Last Supper. That language of eating and drinking is so vital. I grew up, Mom and Dad insisted we eat as a family. Uh, we, to this day, we, we insist that we eat as a family. We'll kick people out of the house if we have to, right? This, this is a, a, a vitally important part of, of relationship. Isaiah 25, 6 says, On this mount the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, and, and aged wine well refined. It's interesting, isn't it? The emphasis is, is what, what will the, the new heavens new earth be like? Well, let's talk about food. Right? It isn't just because it's the best food that you and I can afford today, right? Because Kroger don't care. It's raw pork. But rather it is because that where there is food, there will be fellowship. There will be communion. There will be an exercise of love. Revelation 19.9, the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, these are the true words of God. Now, we can talk all day, is this literal food, is it, is it, is it not literal food, is it just metaphor? But, but, but that's kind of missing the point I'm trying to make, is, is, is that there will be love, a gospel-shaped love, by which we'll serve one another with. And, and I think the language of food reminds us of, of that image. And we won't love each other as husband and wife, but as brothers and sisters in, in Christ. And that will be with all the saints. Fifthly, we will learn. We will learn. One of the common presumptions about heaven is that we'll know everything, right? I just like to know why, when I get to heaven, God's going to tell me why that girl dumped me in high school, or whatever it might be, whatever whatever question it is, it's just in the back of your mind, right? Well, we need to be clear that only God is is omniscient, right? Only He knows everything. Um, and Paul tells us that right now we see things. Uh, only dimly, darkly, in a very limited sense. What he doesn't say is that when we all get to heaven, what a glorious day of we'll know everything that will be. That's not what, what Paul says there. What he says is we'll see with clear eyes. I still remember whenever I got glasses for the first time. I had 2200 vision in fifth grade. I was embarrassed by the fact I couldn't see anything. So I just pretended like, like I could. I played sports, went to school, did all that sort of stuff. just didn't tell nobody. And every time they caught me uh, squinting, I unsquinted and, you know, said, you know, dry eyes or something. I don't know. I don't know what excuse I made. But I remember when I got glasses, I had a, I played for a tri-county team, and, and, was, and, and we, we traveled around and everything. And, and uh, uh, that first game I played is the best basketball game I ever played. Why? Because that little basketball goal that you're supposed to put the ball in look, it was that small when I couldn't see. Suddenly, I could have put our entire house in it. You, know, you couldn't miss a shot when it's that big. And the reason is, is because I, I saw with clear eyes. It didn't mean that it was a perfect game or I hit every shot. certainly didn't. But you see with clear eyes. In fact, we get hints of this in the Bible. First, uh, and that's the verse that we, we reference. Let me give Ephesians 2. Uh, that Christ raises, God will raise us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. That word show is the Greek word meaning to reveal. To reveal is to discover. It is to learn. And there's plenty of verses like that in the Bible that, that use that sort of language. In other words, we will never cease to discover the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? You want to know why heaven's not going to be boring? You'll never cease to discover the goodness of God. Every day, there is new blessings, new joys to be found in Christ for an eternity. Isn't that good news? I mean, think about it. We're Americans, and we're often defined by our pioneer spirit of, of discovery, right? And so once we conquered the West, where do we go? We went to the moon, right? And this is the way Americans think. Imagine for eternity discovering more and more the glory of God. Isn't that good news? That God will continue to reveal himself to us. We'll grow in our knowledge of God, the knowledge of eternity. I mean, think about it. You know your spouse. At the same time, you continue to deepen your knowledge of your spouse. And with that comes real intimacy. Right? So yes, you know all things about your spouse. But every day you are knowing more about your spouse. 
Isn't that the fun part of marriage? Isn't that the maddening part of marriage? That's a footnote, but it certainly is a great part of it. Last thing. Obviously, there's more, but I ran out of L words. Lounge. <laughs> Where's my millennials at? <laughs> well, well, it's revival now. <laughs> so long as we don't have to get out of our pew. What we mean here is rest, right? Now, uh, rest in Scripture primarily refers to two things, the, at least theologically speaking. First of all, it means rest from labor. It's kind of what the whole Sabbath thing is, is all about, isn't it? For six days you'll work. You'll till the ground. But on the seventh day you'll rest. Take a day off. I mean, to this day, we have Labor Day for that very reason. It's the only day you're, you're off work unless you're a state worker. The other reference to rest we find in Scripture is resting in Christ. By the way, isn't that what the whole Sabbath thing is all about? The Sabbath isn't so that we can take naps. As glorious as those naps are, as biblical as those naps are, the purpose of the Sabbath, you read it in Exodus 20, is that we may reflect on the creative work of God. For six days God, God labored, and on the seventh he rested. So too, for six days we labor, on the seventh day we, we, we reflect. And that's the whole point. And we do this on Sundays, because what is it that we are reflecting on? That, that, that God is not only our creator, he is also our redeemer. It's a day of rest. Is the day we know that God will provide for us and we live by faith in Him. Now, both of these ideas are presented in the new heavens and the new earth. Let me give you two examples. First of all, Revelation 14. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Now, there's, there's an emphasis on resting in labors, but you'll note who speaks Christ and the Spirit. Where then do we find our rest? Not in a hammock, but in the presence of God. Both, both are presented there, both. So yeah, we, there is that talk of, of labor, right? But at the same time, there's this talk of rest. Both are true. Both are true. Likewise, in, in Hebrews 4, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. So that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And here, here this is a present reality that, that the writer of Hebrews is speaking of. Let, let us right now, because Christ has entered in, 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 into rest, he has, he has done all things. Let us enter into his rest. And the writer of Hebrews has the Sabbath day, Exodus 20, in mind as he's speaking of this. But he says, look, to be a, a Christian to the fullest is to find our rest in Christ. And that's not just whenever we're tired and exhausted, right? It is to daily live in the rest of Christ. In that is the key to peace and love and contentment and joy and all that. Because despite of how chaotic our lives may be, we have found rest in Christ. But you'll notice, where is this rest? It is in Christ. And where is Christ? He's in the presence of God. Heaven is, is, is seen as a place of rest. And don't we usually speak of this language, especially when one has suffered leading up to their death? They, they are resting in Christ. No more suffering, no more pain, no more doctors, no more needles, no more sticks, no more, no more treatments, no more drugs, no more scans, none of that. To rest is to give hope. So what will we be doing in heaven? At the very least, I think we'll, we will be lauding, we will be leading, we will be laboring, we will be loving, we will be learning, we will be lounging. How I long, long for, for that reality. I think beautiful eulogy is right when they sing that on that day we will sing of the name more excellent than angels. The purified bride, the refined heart, speech, and mind. Where unity and fellowship is perfected in the church, where divine love rests in the heart of the inhabitants of the new earth. And receive a crown, only to cast it down at the feet of the resurrected Jesus in a perfect, ceaseless form of worship, singing glory. To the liberating king who came not to conquer kingdoms, but to conquer hearts and to restore men back to what they were intended for. And to escape from this life marked by anguish. A great fountain of love that flows from heaven's gates awaits us. You can take this world, its joys, and its fleeting pleasures. But give us Jesus, our future hope, and our greatest treasure. The fulfillment of our expectation. 
with nothing to separate us, nothing to hinder the saints from the greatest expression of adoration, finally fit with language to describe, with the right words to express, the richness of eternal possession, the blessing of inheritance. But God will be seen through purified eyes, purged from the sin that blinded us from viewing God as glorified, where love will be expressed with the perfect affection. But until then, we wait with the expectation for all that will be acquired. Our Father, I ask that we will, in fact, long for the day that we will see you face to face. Purified and made holy at the final resurrection and glorified body. We will be in awe and in worship. Lord, as we anticipate that day, will you not prepare us now? If we are the bride of Christ and that process of preparing ourselves for the wedding day, it begins now. So may we come to Christ in faith and repentance of our sins. May we shed off this, this old self and put on our new self that you, you give us. That we may become more like Jesus. And Lord, over the last over a week, we've, we've lost two dear saints in our own church. What a great, great comfort it is to know that you love us enough to come down and to rescue us. And you are right now preparing a place for us. So though we mourn and we grieve as we should, we do so not without hope. So would you give us that comfort and hope as we live every day, our everyday lives? No matter how hard life might get, this is not the best there is. We live with a hope that we will one day be with Jesus and all the saints. May we live with the joy that that should give us, as it should. Be with this time of invitation, we pray. Amen. 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 It sins.
with that, I'm going to ask if, uh, if Carrie, will you close us in prayer? Father, our great